Everyone, hello. I thought today I ought just to spend a little time talking about the rather special concert that we were going to do tonight, Thursday, Maundy Thursday. It's a special concert because both works are by Beethoven and the programme is part of the great celebrations we've been having all over the world to celebrate the genius of this great man. The concert we were going to do was two works, the Second Symphony and an oratorio that I'm not sure that the Halle has ever performed. The Second Symphony and this oratorio, together with the Third Piano Concerto and the First Symphony, which had already seen the light of day, made up the programme of an enormous benefit concert for Beethoven in Holy Week in 1803. So we're right there in our Holy Week now this year, and we're going to take half that programme. It would have lasted for hours and hours. By the way, the rehearsal started at eight o'clock on the morning of the concert. And this music so complicated, so unknown, so unfamiliar, so tricky, would have been put together from eight o'clock in the morning until six in the evening. And then they would have had a short break and then done the concert. Unbelievably taxing. The orchestra would have been partly professional, partly amateur. The whole thing would have had a, an experimental, let's see how we do feeling about it. And when you look at some of the details of these pieces that were played that night for the first time, one wonders how it would have sounded. Beethoven conducted where he could and played the solo piano part in the third concerto. And there's a lovely story that he needed somebody to turn the pages for him because nobody played from memory in those days. And he dumped down all this manuscript paper on the piano and the young man who was turning over looked with horror that when the solo piano part started, there were no notes, just a few squiggles to remind Beethoven what he thought he might play. So, of course, he was completely terrified that he had no idea where they were and what the music was going to sound like. Well, the Second Symphony, of course, is a work of great spirit. High spirits. Italian sometimes. One feels the music is near a comic opera. That's not to say there isn't beautiful seriousness in it. The slow movement is lovely, not particularly slow. The last movement is full of a sense of humour. I feel that the spirit of Rossini hangs over the end of the symphony. And it's a wonderful beginning to an evening. But after the interval, we were going to do the, the oratorio, Christ on the Mount of Olives. This is a very interesting piece to me. I'm not sure that the Halle has ever played it. I've certainly never conducted it. I have heard it once, many, many, many years ago. And it's wonderful to find a chance to do this piece in the context of the whole Be Beethoven festival. It takes Christ's suffering and ultimate passion only from the point of view of the, the last night in the Garden of Gethsemane and the arrival of the soldiers to arrest him and take him away. And it celebrates the journey that he is going to make and consequently the oratorio finishes very exultantly as everybody believes in the, the resurrection and the power of his gesture. But this oratorio is scored for singers, of course, and chorus in different ways, different sizes, different characters, and the usual Beethoven orchestra with trombones. The music begins rather solemnly, as you would expect, to set up this nocturnal atmosphere in the garden. Just the trombones, the horns, the bassoons to give it that lovely aura, then the strings still and muted. Then the horns call us to attention.
relatively good at bass there, but suddenly... That gives you an idea of the pace of the drama inherent in the music, creating a special atmosphere, an individual atmosphere. Into this world, Christ speaks. Christ in this, this work is a tenor, which is interesting to me because in the Passion, St Beethoven would have known them and loved them, he's always portrayed with an, a lower male voice. But here he's a tenor and it makes one think whether or not this was a preparation for the great role of Floristan that we played for you a few weeks ago in the second act of Fidelio. This music has a heroism and an incredible difficulty in singing it, full of leaps and runs and passionate declamation. The music for Christ is full of variety, changing the mood, sometimes declamatory, recitative we call it, sometimes a passionate, fast-moving aria, and there's a lot in this music that reminds me of Mozart. I think that Beethoven at this time was hoping that he would be able to write operas. To be an opera composer and have success at it was the dream of every composer. And he knew that he would soon have to write an opera in Italian. And he studied Italian at that time with the composer Salieri, famous for his strange relationship with Mozart, who lived in Vienna. But here he writes in German. And of course, his, his one opera, Fidelio, is also in German. But the idea of finding a style for an opera was in his, the back of his mind. And I think my job as a conductor for this piece would be to draw out a maximum drama and make it very, very full of character, very full of atmosphere, to make the most of the situation. So, of course, you must remember it's an, a night scene, it's a nocturne. Christ sings very beautifully, very passionately. Perhaps the text is not so great. Perhaps it's repetitive too many times. But the emotion in the music is wonderful. And he's interrupted by the arrival of an angel. And she sings this incredible aria, virtuosic. Now this must surely come from Mozart as well. The idea of writing for a female voice with great virtuosity, like in an opera seria, Mozart's Lucia Silla, for instance. And he would have been familiar with this style. He may even have known some of these leading singers who could sing this sort of music. It's very high, it's very florid, it runs around. It reminds us sometimes of Mozart, sometimes of Handel. But underneath it is the energy of Beethoven, quite distinct from all the other people who came before him. After her aria, which the chorus sings with her, Christ sings a duet with her and he's searching for for compassion, for reassurance that this will all be handled right. And she comes as a messenger, as she says, from Jehovah, from God. Then the whole atmosphere of the, of the peace changes with the arrival of the soldiers. And here the music becomes almost comic, very quiet, very fast, as the soldiers admit that they're here to, to get this man under their control and take him away. There's one other character, and that's Peter the Apostle. And he has a, a, a short but very, very lovely, very important role. And after the, the soldiers have first arrived, they sing a trio together. So there's lots of variety, lots of pace. And when the soldiers finally come upon Christ and are determined to do what they have to do, the music becomes just like Fidelio with Pizarro. It's ferocious, very dramatic. And there's a very significant part for the other apostles. And I had thought that when we do this, we would do it with the younger voices from the Royal Northern College of Music. And perhaps we might even have 12, who knows? The music, as I say, is full of pace, which is great because the early part of the piece has been so slow. There is another trio with the three soloists, interrupted by the chorus, pressing him to come with them. And Christ is, is by now, resigned to his fate, happy to go, happy in the knowledge that something wonderful, something memorable and important for humankind will come. And that leads straight into the last chorus, 
which has a lot of handle in it. It has a lot of Haydn. It reminds us of the end of part two of the creation, for instance, the heavens are telling. And it has a sense of purpose and a celebratory sense of climax that the piece needs. And in fact, this chorus we played for you, we sang for you at the first of our Beethoven concerts earlier in the year. So you see, this programme would have been a great journey for us all, a symphony that we may know and love already, and an oratorio lasting 50 minutes, 55 minutes, that would take us into an area of Beethoven that we'd never heard before. So that is just to whet your appetite, everybody, for what we might have done and what we could well do in the future if we could find the right time to do it. It comes at the right time of year, doesn't it? And it allows me to say to you all, I hope you have a really happy atmosphere in your home for this Easter.